protect parental rights and curb abortion coercion. The abortion industry turnaway study is getting more focus as lead author Diana Green Foster repeatedly highlights what she calls the most important findings from the study, the ones that support abortion. Besides other studies criticizing her work, her own final two conclusions, the ones she finds less important, reinforce pro-life contentions. Within five years, women denied abortion don't regret missing abortion, and financial difficulties resolve themselves. This is Life News Radio. 40 Days for Life is prayer and life-affirming witness at abortion businesses near you. You can be part of providing life-affirming help as we work to end abortion in our communities. Find your local prayer vigil at 40daysforlife.com. That's the number 40daysforlife.com. North Carolina abortions are dropping markedly. The state has a tighter 12-week abortion restriction and added state funding to help women choose life for their child. Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer is renewing efforts to expand abortion in Michigan. One Detroit Democrat stands in her way, calling the package too extreme. Constituents tell Representative Karen Witsit that abortion falls heaviest on the black community. And Witsit says abortion funding dollars could better support struggling seniors living in poverty. For pro-life headlines delivered to your email address daily, sign up at lifenews.com. This has been Life News Radio. This is Franciscan Media Saint of the Day for October 13th. Today we celebrate Blessed Marie Rose du Rocher. Drawn to religious life, poor health kept her from pursuing this vocation. Instead, she spent 13 years as housekeeper, hostess, and parish worker for her priest brother's parish in the village of Bouloil. As a young woman, Eulalie hoped that one day there would be a community of teaching sisters for every Montreal parish. Well known for her graciousness, courtesy, leadership, and tact, she was called the Saint of Beloyal. Eulalie's spiritual director encouraged her to begin her own community, which she was reluctant to do. Finally agreeing, she and two friends moved into a house across the St. Lawrence River from Montreal, where they began a boarding school with 13 students. Poverty, trials, sickness, and slander marked the next six years of Sister Marie Rose's life. But from her strong will, intelligence, and common sense were born the Sisters of the Holy Name of Jesus and Mary, a congregation dedicated to education in the faith. Marie Rose du Rocher died in 1849 and was beatified in 1982. There's more about the saints along with inspiration and Catholic resources at our website, saintoftheday.org. From Franciscan Media, this has been Saint of the Day. One man, one woman, for life, for children, for each other, and it's a sacrament. All that you need to fulfill these obligations, these duties of the married state are in the sacrament of marriage. It does not matter how difficult a particular marriage is. God will give you the grace to be faithful to the vows that you made to your spouse at his altar. The devil knows this, and he uses it every day. He makes people forget the great power and efficacy of the sacrament of marriage. I am utterly shocked at the number of Catholic couples, married couples, devout Catholics, been married for many years, who do not pray together as husband and wife. That's Sermons for Everyday Living from 6 to 7 a.m. Eastern on the Station of the Cross. This is Joe McLean, and you're listening to the Station of the Cross, proclaiming the fullness of the truth with clarity and charity. Heard around the world on your Android and Apple mobile devices. Go into the world and tell every man that you meet, there is a man on the cross. A Catholic take. What you need to know right now. A bold synthesis of inspiration and information. 
keeping you up to date on the news and issues from a courageous Catholic perspective. A Catholic Take with Joe McLean starts now. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. Has the Antichrist been revealed? I have video. You want to see it? Oh, yeah. Or hear it anyway, or listen to it. Or what is the deal with this particular person in Jerusalem today? Why do all the Hasidic rabbis go to visit him? Why do they meet with him? Why do they kiss his hand? Why do they crowd around him? Why do they hang on every single word? What are they saying about the miraculous healings that he has caused them and the salvation that comes through his blessing? Yeah, that's happening right now in Jerusalem. Could it be that the Antichrist has already been revealed and you didn't even get the memo? Well, we're going to jump into that at some point in this show today. And I have video. I have video to share with you. But more importantly than just that, because Antichrist come and Antichrist go... What do we believe? What do we know about the Antichrist? I've been going through a book by Taylor Marshall on the apocalypse, and it's very good. It, Antichrist in the apocalypse, and it is very, very good. I'm going to be sharing this book with you, at least bits and parts of it, to uh, sort of illustrate what we believe. What do we know about the Antichrist? That's coming up today at 30 past the hour as we dive into the Antichrist as well as uh, show you some of the video clips coming out of Jerusalem. But today, October the 13th, there is a call for a global uprising of jihad. But the counter to that is the global uprising of saints. And Our Lady on October the 13th, 1917, she made the sun dance in the sky. Many people, 70,000 thought they were going to die that day because the sun looked like it was coming crashing down. So we're going to share a little bit of that with you and the eyewitness testimonies. And then, of course, to remind us all of what Our Lady asked all of us to do, to pray, to fast, to do penance. For what? The conversion of heart ardent sinners. And if we don't, bad things happen. We're going to talk about that at 14 past the hour with Mike Koeniger, who's going to join us on the show. So it's going to be a, a full show. We're going to link to everything we talk about today in the show notes, including all the video clips and everything else, over at thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. That's thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. Hey, by the way, it is being reported this morning that Cardinal Mueller has responded to the response by Cardinal Fernandez against the dubia to Cardinal Duca, saying the Cardinal goes against the Catholic doctrine and with him is the Pope. Also, Planned Parenthood was destroyed in Gaza. It's good news. Praise be to God. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and now your saint of the day. King St. Edward the Confessor, pray for us. In the words of Father Alban Butler regarding today's saint, God often gives bad princes in his wrath, but in a good king he bestoweth a great public blessing on a nation. Edward was born in the early 11th century to King Ethelred II. He was the nephew of King St. Edward the Martyr, whose death was part of a period of instability in the rule of England after the peaceful reign of King St. Edgar. When the Danes fully took over England in 1016, the young Edward was forced to live in exile on the continent for over two decades, losing a brother and half-brothers to the machinations of the Danish rulers. When Danish power weakened in the 1040s, Alfred finally made a triumphant return, an English king welcomed by the English people. Edward proved an exemplar of Christian kingship, earning the admiration even of the Danes still living in England. His reign was a peaceful one, with no major military efforts beyond his support of King Malcolm of Scotland against the infamous Macbeth. Edward was gifted with visions, and he zealously supported the church and the poor. One story relates that he carried a poor paralytic to Mass on his back, at which the man was healed. The king was the first English monarch to heal scrofula, or the king's evil, at a mere touch, beginning a regular royal custom in England. He was devoted to St. John the Evangelist, and on one occasion gave his royal ring to a poor beggar who was, in fact, St. John in disguise. St. John sent back the ring with a prediction of the king's death so that he might worthily prepare. King Edward died in 1066 with no direct heir since his was a Josephite marriage. He was succeeded by his brother-in-law, Harold Godwinson, the last crowned Anglo-Saxon king, 
killed at Hastings later that same year in battle with William the Conqueror. Edward was canonized in 1161 by Pope Alexander III and for 200 years was a primary patron of England before the official adoption of St. George. King St. Edward the Confessor, pray for us. And now your headline news. Breitbart reports France bans pro-Palestinian rallies will arrest and deport troublemakers. The French interior minister wrote to the nation's departments and regions on Thursday, informing them that he had banned pro-Palestinian demonstrations because they are likely to generate disturbances to the public order. He advised that foreign perpetrators of anti-Semitism causing trouble at pro-Palestinian protests should have their residence permits revoked and be deported without delay. The Messenger reports U.S. Qatar agreed to free $6 billion worth of Iranian funds. The $6 billion in frozen Iranian funds that were set to be released in exchange for American hostages being returned home will not be delivered to Iran following reports of the nation backing Hamas's attack on Israel. The United States and Qatar have come to a quiet understanding that Qatar will not deliver the $6 billion as originally planned. During a press conference Thursday, National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby said that, quote, every single dime of the $6 billion was still in the possession of Qatar. Catholic Vote reports Scalise no longer running for speaker. House Majority Leader Steve Scalise from Louisiana has dropped out of the race for House Speaker. He announced the decision following a closed-door meeting with fellow House Republicans Thursday evening. Quote, our conference still has to come together, and it is not there. The country is counting on us to come back together. Close quote. And those, those are your headline news. The gospel today comes to us from Luke chapter 11, verses 15 through 26. When Jesus had driven out a demon, some of the crowd said, By the power of Beelzebul, the prince of demons, he drives out demons. Others, to test him, asked him for a sign from heaven. But he knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be laid waste, and house will fall against house. And if Satan is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that it is by Beelzebul that I drive out demons. If I then drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your own people drive them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man fully armed guards his palace, his possessions are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks and overcomes him, he takes away the armor on which he relied and distributes the spoils. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. When an unclean spirit goes out of someone, it roams through arid regions searching for rest, but finding none. It says, I shall return to my home from which I came. But upon returning, it finds it swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and brings back seven other spirits more wicked than itself who move in and dwell there. And the last condition of that man is worse than the first. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. St. Chrysostom said, But if he who does not work with me is my adversary, how much more he who opposes me? It seems, however, to me that he here under a figure refers to the Jews, ranging them with the devil. For they also acted against and scattered those whom he gathered together. Rejecting the Messiah comes with consequences. Can we just say that? St. Chrysostom, pray for us. A Catholic commentary in Holy Scripture says this, the ancient Semites, like the modern Arabs, attributed disease to demonic influence, especially such diseases as induce an apparent change of personality like madness. Rationalist critics maintain that our Lord was subject to the same superstition and it is common for Orthodox scholars to reply that he merely accommodated his language to the current notions of his time. Sound familiar? 
Sounds like something we might even hear coming out of certain offices in Rome these days. Anyway, but the but that cannot be true. Of all the cases in the gospel, for our Lord accepts diabolical possession as an objective reality as the church does still. The fact is that there is nothing theologically wrong in attributing all human ills to diabolical agency from the fall downwards. Did you catch that? There is nothing wrong with attributing all human ills to diabolical agency from the fall downwards. We live in a fallen world. We live amongst fallen human beings with a concupiscent nature. We have a disordered passion towards evil, towards sin. The only answer is Christ, the sacraments he provides us through his church. We must make frequent use of confession, the Holy Eucharist, and of course the sacramentals and the devotions. The well of mercy is massive. It is endless. Unless, of course, we refuse to take and make use of it. Then, of course, what are we going to do then? We just refuse God's mercy and we just wait idly for his judgment? Bad things happen when that happens. Repent, fast, do penance. That is what we've been called to. Hold fast to the true Messiah and ignore all false pretenders. We'll be right back. Hello, this is Steve Gleason with your one-minute tool for Catholic evangelism. Here's the question for your non-Catholic friend. How much havoc would be caused at your church if your pastor brought a big statue of St. Peter or St. Paul and placed them in the sanctuary? Well, here's your three best friendship tools for Catholic evangelism. Number one, history's on the side of the Catholic Church. Christian art in many forms dates way back to about 120 A.D. And so do those various Christian symbols which we still see today. You know, a dove, a fish, a lamb. Why are those okay? Secondly, the Bible, Exodus, Numbers, and Ezekiel. All these books show God telling Moses, David, or Ezekiel to carve out images of angels that were used in worship. And, and thirdly, a tough comeback, especially for my guy friends. Does Cooperstown, Canton, or Cleveland mean anything to you? Yep, the Hall of Fame locations filled with statues, jerseys, bats, and balls. Memorabilia is a $37 billion industry, but you say, don't bring a statue into my church. Well, how many of you guys have admired one of those bronze statues of an athlete? I'd rather stare at St. Peter's, Paul, and Mary in my church, and I'm not talking about the old folk band. Ask a Priest Live, weekdays at 6 p.m. Eastern on the Station of the Cross. We'll bring you a different priest each weekday where you can participate in a live Q&A on the topics that matter. To get your question in for Father, call 1-877-511-5483 while the show is live. Email us anytime at priests at thestationofthecross.com or visit our show page at thestationofthecross.com slash askapriest. I'm Jim Havens, host of The Simple Truth, heard weekdays at 4 p.m. Eastern on the Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network. If Jesus meant what he said, as thousands of people are leaving him, don't you think he would have corrected him if they got him wrong? But he didn't, so he must have said what he meant, and he is the Eucharist. And no one else has that but the Catholic Church. And my wife said, what do you think? I said, I think we're Catholic. That's The Simple Truth, weekdays at 4 p.m. Eastern on the Station of the Cross. Be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. Coming up at 30 past the hour, I want to talk about the Antichrist. I've got video. I want to tease you. I'm going to play this video um, and clips of it as I talk about the Antichrist. There's a particular man in Jerusalem right now that some, some are claiming is the Messiah. Could that be the Antichrist? Could it? Isn't that fascinating just to think about we're going to get into that at 30 past the hour. Plus, I'm going to share with you some insights from the Taylor Marshall book on Apocalypse because it's very, very good. Highly recommended, actually. I've been through the whole book once. I'm going through it two and three times just because uh, I'm preparing to go to Rome to film a documentary, and I find this an invaluable resource. So we're going to talk about that at 30 past the hour. Could the Antichrist be walking the streets of Jerusalem as we talk right now? Isn't that fascinating? We're going to get into it, so don't uh, don't go anywhere. We're, we're going to jump all over that. But today is the day of the remembrance of the miracle of the sun, October the 13th, 1917. And um, today's the day that they've called for an international jihad, a Muslim uprising 
all over the world. Let that sink in for a moment. What a contrast. Our Lady appearing at Fatima, the Cova, in Portugal, 1917, on a series of apparitions from May all the way to October. It was the July ones that got really scary. The July uh, messages got really scary because uh, she showed the children the vision of hell and the souls and the demons that were in utter torment and despair for all eternity. And how many souls that went to hell because no one prayed for them. Sins of the flesh, worldly sins that they chose and they would spend the rest of their eternity there. And then, of course, come October, she appears and there was a miracle a miracle that no one could deny. I want to read a little bit to you, and Mike Koeniger is joining us. He's going to share some insights on some of the witnesses, the witness testimony. But uh, during the night of the 12th, 13th October, it rained throughout, soaking the ground and the pilgrims who make their way to Fatima from all directions by the thousands. By foot, by cart, and even by car, they came, entering the bowl of the Kova from the Fatima from the Fatima Road, which today still passes in front of the large square of the Basilica. From there, they made their way down the gentle slope to the place where the trestle had been erected over the little home oak of the apparitions. Today on the site is the modern glass and steel, the little chapel, enclosing the first chapel built there, and the statue of Our Lady of the Rosary of Fatima, where the home oak had stood. As for the children, they made their way to the Kova amid the adulation and skepticism which had followed them since May. When they arrived, they found critics who questioned their veracity and the punctuality of, the, of Our Lady, who had promised to arrive at noon. It was well past noon by the official time of the country. However, the sun arrived at its zenith. The Lady appeared as she said that she would. What do you want of me? Sister Lucia asked. I want a chapel built here in my honor. I want you to continue saying the rosary every day. The war will end soon and the soldiers will return home. Yes, yes, said Lucia. Will you tell me your name? I am the Lady of the Rosary. I have many petitions from many people. Will you grant them? asked Lucia. Our Lady responds, Some I shall grant, and others I must deny. People must amend their lives and ask pardon for their sins. They must not offend our Lord anymore, for he is already too much offended. <sighs> Did you catch that? You must amend your life. We must stop offending God who was already too much offended. I want you to let that sink in. Because when Our Lady appears, she, she brings about a miracle. Lucia goes on to ask, and is that all you have to ask? Our Lady responds, there is nothing more. As the Lady of the Rosary rises towards the east, she turns the palms of her hands toward the dark sky. While the rain had stopped, Dark clouds continued to obscure the sun, which suddenly bursts through them and is seen to be a soft spinning disk of silver. Look at the sun, said Lucia. From this point, two distinct apparitions were seen. That of the phenomenon of the sun seen by the 70,000 people or so, and that beheld by the children alone. Lucia describes the latter in her memoirs. Now, the crowds, they can see the sun and all that the sun is doing. But the children, they can see something more. And it comes from her diary, from her memoirs, that she was under obedience to, to write, by the way, by her bishop. After Our Lady had disappeared into the immense distance of the firmament, we beheld St. Joseph with the child Jesus and Our Lady robed in white with the blue mantle beside the sun. St. Joseph and the child Jesus seemed to bless the world, for they traced the sign of the cross with their hands. When a little later this apparition disappeared, I saw Our Lord and Our Lady. It seemed to me that it was Our Lady of Sorrows. Our Lady of Sorrows. Let that sink in for a second. Our Lady of Sorrows. Our Lady of La Salette. 
Our Lady who had a message of a time of chastisement, a time of confusion, a time when many in the church would apostatize. Our Lady of Sorrows. Our Lord appeared to bless the world in this same manner as St. As Joseph had done. This apparition also vanished, and I saw Our Lady once more, this time resembling Our Lady of Carmel. Only later, Lucia would see... Pres uh, only Lucia would see the latter presaging her entrance into the Carmel some years later. This would be the last of the apparitions of Fatima for Jacinta and Francisco. However, for Lucia, Our Lady would return a seventh time in 1920, as she had promised the previous May. At that time, Lucia would be praying in the Cova before leaving for Fatima, leaving Fatima for a girls' boarding school. The Lady would come to urge her to dedicate herself wholly to God. As the children viewed the various apparitions of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, the crowd witnessed a different prodigy, the now famous miracle of the Son. Among the witnesses, there were the following. And joining us right now is Mike Koenig, a friend of the show, the brick wall, our famous brick wall from Virginia. Good morning to you, Mike. Hey, good morning, Joe. Vivo Crystal Ray. Vivo Crystal Ray, my friend. And uh, boy, what a day, huh? So let's talk about some of these uh, eyewitness accounts uh, that I find fascinating. There was the newspaper accounts, but there was also accounts from people that were miles and miles away, and they also witnessed the miracle of the sun. Tell us about it. Well, it, it's it's an incredible, and you know, when I returned to the faith, this is one of the things that I started studying almost immediately uh, because I'm just fascinated by it. <clears throat> Excuse me. We had we there are a lot of accounts, and, and Joe, the first one that hit me, and I hope you don't mind if I read a little bit of it, is actually from it. a daily newspaper. It, it's a daily newspaper. It's considered to be have been in support of the atheistic uh, progressive movement that had taken over at that point, and and it said. It's from Odia, uh, and it says, We looked easily at the sun, which for some reason did not blind us. And anyone who stared at the sky knows better. It seemed to flicker on and off, first one way, then another. It cast its rays in many directions and painted everything in different colors, the trees, the people, the air, the ground. But what was most extraordinary, I thought, was that the sun did not hurt our eyes. Everything was still and quiet, and everyone was looking up. Then, at a certain moment, the sun appeared to stop spinning. It then began to move and dance in the sky until it seemed to detach itself from its place and fall upon us. It was a terrible moment. And, and that, from someone who wasn't a believer, it's just such an amazing account to me, Joe. Yeah. Yeah. I, what I find utterly fascinating is how these people, these witnesses... Um, the whole time, for all of these aberrations, through all these months, they can't personally see anything. They just see three children kneeling and looking up and, and their mouth moving and they're not hearing the conversation. And then to have gone from that to seeing the sun come crashing down on them and utter terror. So many thought that they were actually going to die that day. Can you just imagine the kind of emotional impact that's going to have on someone for the rest of their lives? I cannot. I, I cannot. I, I. They got to witness a miracle that so few of us ever get in our lives, and, and you know, in that moment, they saw the wonderfulness and the wrath of our Lord in in the span of a few minutes. And uh, and, and of course, you know, the Queen of Heaven was the conduit, just as she is right now every day in our lives. The Queen of Heaven was the conduit through this. And the, the one I've always put my, the, the one of the three children I've always put myself in the place of, I believe his name is Jacinto, right? Jacinto, the little Jacinta, boy? Jacinto, yeah. 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 And, and he could see the lady, but he could not hear her. Oh, you're talking about Jacinta's brother, Francesca. Bro was it the, Francesca, yeah. the brother, the brother who could see but yeah, could not he, hear. He was told he had to pray many rosaries in order to make it to heaven. <laughs> but what's fascinating is we, we, after oh, after all of this, after all this, it was Francisco. He wanted to spend every waking moment in adoration in the chapel. He wanted to to be before the Blessed Sacrament, and he would pray his rosaries nonstop. There was clearly a change in him from before and after. He would spend the rest of his life, his young life, because he died young along with his sister, uh, you know, trying to make reparation as Our Lady asked. Oh, and 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 was happy to go 
to glory was 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 happy to go to glory you know if you read the accounts before before our lady before the angel appeared to the three they would talk about how they did the rosary where they would say our father who art in heaven and that would be their our father and hail mary full of grace and that would be their hail mary so they would always cut short and abbreviate their rosary and the radical change in all three of the children after these appearances where they became very prayerful, very thoughtful. You know, they tied the rope around their waist uh, and were told that they could do that while they were awake, but not to do it while they were sleeping because, of course, they were little ones. And, and all the things that they did, it, it's just it's just so astounding. And, and here you and I are, Joe, and I'm just going to convict myself. I'm not convicting anyone else, but I don't live with that forever in my life, and I probably ought to, right? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's part of the challenge we have, isn't it? Our Lady's message was quite clear. Repent, do penance for whom? For sinners. And how often do we actually pray for ardent sinners? I mean, St. Therese of Lisieux gave her life for ardent sinners. Uh, yesterday, we talked about Father Willie Doyle, who gave himself over for ardent sinners, sinners in the, in the priesthood. Bishops and priests who commit grave sins, he gave his life for that. Dead three weeks later, St. Padre Pio gave 50 years of his life uh, for the sins of the clergy. For bishops, priests, cardinals, and their and the sins that they would commit, he had a vision of what that looked like, and he gave himself over to that uh, to that cause. For 50 years, he suffered, and Our Lady asked for that for these children. Our Lady allowed these children to see hell itself, the horrible monsters. They said they were so frightened by what they saw that they feared that they were going to die if it wasn't for that. Our Lady told them they were going to go to heaven, then they would have died out of fright alone. This is so serious, so serious, that the queen of heaven would show children the vision of hell to wake up the world. That you guys, your hard hearts, your stiff necks, you are offending God, you are not repenting, you are not sacrificing yourselves in any meaningful way. And as a result, the world grows darker. Well, what do you think the conclusion is going to be when a world grows darker? But the end times, the chastisements, they come. Whether it's the end or just getting close. What's the difference if bad things are about to happen? Repent, do penance. Let's talk about the Antichrist and what we can actually expect. expect. That's coming up next. Don't go anywhere. the Station of the Cross, we proudly bring the truths of the Catholic faith to countless listeners through radio and mobile devices, and we're grateful for the feedback we've received. Catholic radio has just been a lifesaver for me. I start my day with it. I listen to it all day long as much as I can. There's always people calling in with people who've lost children, and I love it. everyone has to say and the advice of the Catholic Church and how to deal with suffering. It has given me the strength to get through the day and to get out of bed each morning. I am very grateful for it. Catholic Radio to me has been very informative on my religion. It has informed me of many things that I wasn't aware of or should have been aware of, and I have enjoyed it very much listening to it. If you've been blessed by listening to the Station of the Cross, let us know. Call 1-877-888-6279, extension 112, then share your testimonial with us. The Station of the Cross began broadcasting in Buffalo, New York in 1999. Since then, our listening areas have multiplied and expanded into several states. While our mission is to grow the Catholic faith through radio and other media outlets, our apostolate is supportive of, but independent from your local diocese. Through your generosity, we are able to inspire countless listeners with the gospel and help lead them to a parish to be spiritually nourished by the sacraments. Father Willie Doyle, an Irish Jesuit priest, known for his joy even in the face of war. His courage made him legendary. His compassion made him beloved. Father Willie gave his life on the battlefield of World War I, insisting that he be with his men. Now his cause for canonization has been opened. To find out more about this man of heroic virtue, visit the Willie Doyle Association at www.willydoyle.org. to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and here are your headline news. 
Just the news reports, Democratic Senator Menendez charged with conspiracy to act as a foreign agent. Senator Bob Menendez from New Jersey was charged with conspiracy to act as a foreign agent on behalf of the Egyptian government. His wife, Nadine, as well as an Egyptian-American businessman, Wael Hanna, were also charged with conspiracy to act as foreign agents, according to the superseding indictment filed Thursday in the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York. Under the Foreign Agents Registration Act, foreign government actors need to register with the U.S. Justice Department. Public officials, including members of Congress, are prohibited under U.S. law from acting as a foreign agent in a manner that would require them to register as one under the act. Menendez did not register under FARA, nor did his wife, nor Mr. Hanna, according to the court document. I guess it's okay for president's sons, though. Anyway, Ground News reports UK to deploy Royal Navy ships to support Israel. The UK is sending two Royal Navy ships to the Eastern Mediterranean and initiating surveillance flights over Israel. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has also allocated an additional three million pounds in funding to protect Jewish community buildings in the UK after increase in anti-Semitic incidents since the assault. The funding will enable increased security measures at schools and at synagogues. Catholic Vote reports a day of prayer and fasting today. As Hamas calls for a global day of jihad today, this Friday, the October the 13th, a Catholic apostolate is making it a worldwide day of fasting and prayer for peace. The Vulnerable People Project, our good friend Jason Jones, will lead a rosary live on Facebook at 3 p.m. Eastern today, this afternoon, to intercede for peace in Israel and Palestine, the organization announced. Quote, we are also urging everyone to take an hour of silent contemplative prayer on what it means to love God and to love one's neighbor. Close quote. And those, those are your headline news. Prayer, fasting, and penance. That is, that is what we are called to do. So if you can join the Vulnerable People Project this afternoon, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Facebook, just search for their Facebook page. You'll find it, but we can put a link to it in the show notes over at the Station of the Cross dot com forward slash act by the way last week was fun drive so i did not send out an email i'll do that today i'm going to share with you uh the uh, lepanto poem that we produced as a team i think it came out fantastic very proud of the team that put that together and let us remember our lady of victory especially in times just like this so i'll have that plus some other goodies for you in the email this afternoon. If you would like to get in on the email, all you got to do is join the insider email list over at the website, thestationofthecross.com forward slash A-C-T. That's thestationofthecross.com forward slash A-C-T. I want to get into it. Mike Koenig is still on the line with us. Mike, feel free to, to chime in, but I want to get into the Antichrist a little bit. False Christs and false prophets. Matthew chapter 24, verse 24. In his book, Antichrist and Apocalypse, Taylor Marshall quotes this verse. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders in so much as to deceive, if possible, even the elect. That last part should give you the chills. There will come an Antichrist who will deceive even the elect. I want to get into what that means. But yesterday, I happened across a post on X, on, uh, on the Twitters. It's an old post. It's not even a new one. But for some odd reason, it's making the rounds today. And I saw this post, and it caught me off guard because it says, Is Messiah born? Yes. And he lives in Israel. And he had meetings with some of the rabbis. Did the Messiah reveal himself? Not yet. Is Yanuka Rav Shlomo Yehuda the Jewish Messiah? He has not claimed it yet, even though he did perform many miracles. I was very fascinated by this. And of course, when I see a thread, I just got to pull on it. I got to yank on that thread. And I went and yanked for a few hours, actually, last night. As I researched this person, Rav Shlomo Yehuda, the Yanuka, they call him. Who is this guy, this mysterious character, this interesting, mysterious character that seems to be attracting so much attention in Israel? 
a very interesting character. Well, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this guy because although he personally, as far as I could tell, to my knowledge, he personally does not claim to be Messiah. However, comma, the Hasidic Jews seem to think of him like he could be the Messiah. They, in fact, are speaking of it in ways that I think are incredible to say the least. So I want to share a little bit about you, uh, about, with you, about the Antichrist, specifically about this guy. But I want to get into the book a little bit by Taylor Marshall as well. The Yanuka, the these Hasidic Jews. I'm going to be linking to this in the show notes, of course, at the stationacross.com forward slash ACT. Rav Shlomo Yaudabari, born in Spain in around 1988, a child prodigy. By the time he was 17, some said 15, some sources said 15. By the time he was a teenager, let's just say, let's split the diff. He was a teenager. He had already memorized the Torah. He could recite the Torah by sheer memory, as well as the Talmud. Do you have any idea how big the Talmud is? It's massive, massive. He could recite the Talmud. He could recite the Jewish mystics and, and more from memory. By the time he was a teenager, he was attracting disciples to himself. People were already flocking to him and to be students of his when he was a teenager. Already he, his reputation was growing uh, amongst Hasidic Jews. Now, his father, his father is from the uh, Assyrian side, but I couldn't find almost anything about his mom. I don't know why. There was just not much information shared, talked about, at least in the sources and the time that I spent on the topic about his mother, just his father. And now his father goes back to the Assyrian line. He was given a prearranged marriage, so he did not get to choose his wife. I have no idea anything about his wife. I couldn't find any information on that. But uh, here's the deal. A big, large crowds. He attracts large crowds of Hasidic Jews. Now, I think it's important to point out, it's not as though all of Israel th are, is thinking of him in terms of uh, being the Messiah. So, so far as I could tell, it's really just Hasidic or ultra-Orthodox Jews. And I did check the stats on this. As of right now, Ultra-Orthodox Jews represent roughly 17% of the population in Israel. So that's not a majority. But amongst these ultra-Orthodox Jews, they seem to be looking at him in ways that I think should be chilling. They use such words to, to describe him as illuminated. Salvation comes through his blessing. Transcending the forces of nature. This is the language that these rabbis, these, uh, these men who are considered the, the greatest minds in Jewish thought and law, they're the ones calling this young man who happens to be in his 30s. In fact, he was 33 when he came to, to the Western Wall in 2021. And now everybody in the Hasidic community seems to be flocking to him. They kiss his hand. They seek his blessing. And now there are many reports about his miracles that have been attributed to his blessings. I find it very fascinating. What's even more fascinating, I mean, I'm talking about miracles like uh, healing from cancer, uh, prophecies that have come true that he has, he has spoken. So a mysterious character, to say the least. And what's also very interesting and fascinating about this person is that he is of small significance. I mean, I would imagine that maybe even most Jews don't even really know who he is. But the fact that they call him the Yanuka is a term that seems to indicate he is very, very special. And this is why everybody seems to be flocking towards him right now. So, all right, so that's, that's Yanuka. Rav Shlomo Yehuda, could he be the Antichrist today? I have no idea. And as I said earlier, to my knowledge, he personally has not made that claim. It's other people who are claiming that they are already meeting with the Messiah right now in Jerusalem. And this is the man who seems to be the potential person for that. Is it true? I don't know. But I will say this. Let's jump into the Antichrist. I find it very fascinating because as I'm preparing to go to,
go to Rome to film a, uh, a documentary film on the end times. I've been going through several, uh, a stack of books. One of them is this one, Antichrist and Apocalypse, the 21 prophecies of Revelation unveiled and described by Dr. Taylor Marshall. Now, no matter how you feel about Dr. Taylor Marshall, you should go check out this book. It's a great book. There's nothing in this book that's going to be scandalous or controversial in any way, shape, or form. This is a book that just deals with the apocalypse. What do we believe? And he, he spends a large amount of time just talking about the Antichrist. Who is he? What do we know about him? What do we believe about him? And what do we believe are the timeline of events? I highly recommend it. We'll put a link to it in the description or rather in the show notes, the station So let's go through. He's got a chapter just on, uh, on what we believe about the antichrist summarized. It's all bullet points. It's not even like paragraphs, just bullet points. I want to go through that with you a little bit and share with you a little bit of the, uh, of the quotes. Number one, he will be a true human man. He will not be the devil incarnate. The devil's not going to take upon flesh like Jesus take upon, took upon flesh because the devil cannot create. He can mock, but he can't create. He can pretend, but he can't do what God does. He is not God's equal. He is not God's equal and opposite. That's not how that works. He is a creature, and he can only mock and ape God. Number two, he will be conceived of fornication. Interesting. I couldn't, I couldn't really find anything on... Rav Shlomo's, the eunuch's mother. I'm not sure what the story is there. Maybe his mom and dad were perfectly great people, and maybe that excludes him from the list of Antichrist. I don't know. I couldn't find any information. He will be an Israelite. Did you know that the Antichrist is going to be an Israelite? Yeah, it's true. In fact, point number four on the list is the Antichrist will keep the Sabbath and follow the Jewish laws of Moses, circumcision, and kosher living. Let me share some quotes with you from Taylor Marshall's book. Chapter 13 of the Apocalypse, says Taylor Marshall, introduces the concept of the beast, of the Antichrist, who is a beast rising from the sea. It also introduces his sidekick, the false prophet, as a beast rising from the land. Satan and these two beasts form an unholy trinity against God and his people. He mocks God. If God is a trinity of divine persons, so he has to come up with his anti-trinity. And that is what we're going to be seeing in the end times. He goes on to quote, The Antichrist will rise from a modest nation. Now, this is quoting St. Jerome's commentary on the book of Daniel. If you and I purchased a copy of the book of Daniel, uh, the commentary on the book of Daniel by Jerome. It's one of the books in the stack I have. And he's quoting here from chapter 11 of St. Jerome's commentary. St. Jerome gave us the Latin Vulgate, which today we get the Douay Rheims from. St. Jerome is one of the foremost scripture scholars in the history of planet Earth. And he says this, the Antichrist will rise from a modest nation that is from the people of the Jews. He will be so lowly and despised that he will not be given royal honor, but he shall obtain rule through treachery and deceit. He will do this because he will feign himself as the leader of the covenant that is the law and the covenant of God. So the Antichrist will be from Jewish ancestry. He will follow the law, the pharisaical version of the law, and he will want the whole world to do the same. Oh, yeah, it's true. The Peshitta renders, says Taylor Marshall, quote, false Christ in Matthew 24, 24 as a liar Messiah. So Christ explicitly warns us that liar messiahs will in fact arrive to deceive not merely the secular world, but chiefly Christ's own disciples. The attack will be into the interior of his church, his elect. The attack will be into the interior of of his church, the elect. Our Lord warned us in Matthew 24 that even the elect can be led astray by the Antichrist. I have more to share with you on what we believe and what we know about the Antichrist and what we might expect in these difficult and challenging times that we find ourselves in today. But our mission doesn't change. No matter what happens in Palestine, the world around us or your backyard or even the Vatican or Washington, D.C., you and I are called to the same thing, to pray, to fast, to do penance for the salvation of sinners. Let us mortify ourselves today. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. More to come. 
This is Franciscan Media Saint of the Day for October 13th. Today we celebrate Blessed Marie Rose du Rocher. Drawn to religious life, poor health kept her from pursuing this vocation. Instead, she spent 13 years as housekeeper, hostess, and parish worker for her priest brother's parish in the village of Bouloil. As a young woman, Eulalie hoped that one day there would be a community of teaching sisters for every Montreal parish. Well known for her graciousness, courtesy, leadership, and tact, she was called the Saint of Beloyal. Eulalie's spiritual director encouraged her to begin her own community, which she was reluctant to do. Finally agreeing, she and two friends moved into a house across the St. Lawrence River from Montreal, where they began a boarding school with 13 students. Poverty, trials, sickness, and slander marked the next six years of Sister Marie Rose's life. But from her strong will, intelligence, and common sense were born the Sisters of the Holy Name of Jesus and Mary, a congregation dedicated to education in the faith. Marie Rose du Rocher died in 1849 and was beatified in 1982. There's more about the saints along with inspiration and Catholic resources at our website, saintoftheday.org. From Franciscan Media, this has been Saint of the Day. It is a scientific fact that life begins at fertilization. Every human being is a human person. It already says in the 14th Amendment of our U.S. Constitution that all persons are to have equal protection under the laws. Yet we have an ongoing mass murder of our little pre-born brothers and sisters under the big lie of abortion. The Supreme Court must explicitly affirm federal protection for our last excluded class and end this constitutional crisis. Use your voice and sign the petition now at thestationofthecross.com. Be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. We're talking about the Antichrist. Mike Koeniger is still on with us, and uh, I'm, you know, he's probably going to be chiming in more in the after show coming up at the top of the hour. We say goodbye to our radio audience. We stay on the live video feed where we get to take your commentary, and I'd be fascinated to see what Mike has to think about a potential Jewish anti uh, Antichrist, uh, a potential false liar messiah walking the streets of jerusalem today which by the way he's pushing for the rebuilding of the third temple today is the call for the global jihad to to do what to protect al aqsa what is al aqsa it is the temple mount where the the muslim mosque is in jerusalem because they know the jews want to build another temple and they want to take it back so they are flooding al aqsa today and they are asking for worldwide Muslim uprising today, October the 13th, to protect Al-Aqsa. It's a big part of the deal. There is a huge push. A lot has changed in Israel just over the past 10 years alone, pushing for a third temple. Did you know that? Did you know that? So let's pray fast and do penance today. And uh, let's have an uprising of saints. How about that? That'd be amazing. But the Antichrist, we're going to talk about the Antichrist a little bit more before we run out of time. I've been sharing with you the book of Taylor Marshall, The Antichrist and the Apocalypse. It's a great book. I do encourage you to check it out. You, no matter how you feel about Dr. Taylor Marshall, this book has nothing to do with any controversies. This is simply what the church teaches, what the fathers teach about the end times, the book of the apocalypse in particular. He goes through every single word in the book of Revelation, the book of the Apocalypse. And he sp spends a lot of time on the Antichrist, and he has, to get, he has a breakdown on the timeline. It is fascinating. It is a scripture study, and it is easy to read, and you're going to love it. I highly recommend it. At any rate, uh, so the Antichrist, I left off at point four. He's going to be a Jewish person, a person who, who claims to be Messiah, a person who wants the whole world to follow the law. Think of the Judaizers that St. Paul was dealing with. That's going to be the Antichrist. All right? So point number five on Taylor's list in his The Antichrist Summarized Chapter. Before the Antichrist is revealed, the gospel must be preached to all nations. Has it been preached to all persons? No. But to all nations? Yes. 100%. Absolutely. The gospel has gone to all four corners of the earth, even if it hasn't reached the ears of of every single human person, it has gone to every corner of planet Earth. That is demonstrable. Point number six, his coming will be signaled by the great apostasy, a mass falling away from Christ. Huh, 
What would that look like? I'm just curious. What would it? What would a great apostasy look like if it didn't look like 67% of American Catholics do not believe in the true presence of Christ in the Eucharist? What would it look like if it does not look like prelates, cardinals, leaders of dicasteries, dare I say, even to the highest levels of, of the Vatican, proclaiming and teaching things that we formerly believed to be horrible, evil, mortal sins, heretical teaching being spread by prelates of the church today? That sounds like confusion. That sounds awful a lot like apostasy to me, doesn't it? I mean, what, what does the great apostasy look like? I mean, could the, uh, could the could could anybody push back against me to say, hold on, Joe, hold on. Are you kidding me? The what the welcoming and inclusion church, they're not the apostates. It's the rad trad church. Does the great apostasy look like smells and bells investments and fidelity to the church's teaching handed on for 2,000 years? Is that what the great apostasy is going to look like? Is it really going to look like holding fast to what St. Jerome would call call right and wrong? let alone uh, St. Padre Pio, St. Therese of Avila, St. Vincent Ferrer, St. Dominic, St. Francis. I mean, go on and on and on and on. St. Maximilian Kolbe, St. Therese of Lisieux. I mean, golly gee whiz, do you think they are, would, would agree? I doubt it. The great apostasy looks like confusion. It looks like what once was taught as true is now all of a sudden bad. That's what the great apostasy looks like. Point number seven, he will deny that Jesus is, the, is of the Father or of the flesh. He will deny that Jesus is of the Father or the flesh. Now, it's interesting because when I look at these posts, these videos of this pretender, Messiah, one of the claims on this post is that this person, quote, any chance that he is the Messiah, we cannot comment on this at this moment, but his legitimacy is already higher than Jesus of Nazareth. This channel, by the way, even though we'll link to this, the, you got to be warned, this is a seriously anti-Christian channel, very obviously pro-Jewish channel, so just be ready for that. Taylor Marshall says, quoting, The Apostle Paul, as noted above, relates that the Antichrist sits in the temple of God, showing himself as if he were God. A similar picture is given by Christ. The abomination of desolation, which was spoken of by Daniel the prophet, will be standing in the holy place. Whether seated, as Paul says, or standing, as Christ says, the Antichrist will enthrone himself in the holy place, which is the temple of God. Is it going to be the third temple in Jerusalem, or will it be the church? Because a lot of people believe it'll be in Rome, at St. Peter's Basilica. But no, in fact, the Antichrist will be of Jewish origin, from the tribe of Dan in particular, as St. Jerome believes. And he will enact a Pharisaical Judy, uh, uh, law, the Pharisaical law, the Pharisaical version of things, just like the Judaizers did that St. Paul so vigorously fought against in every single one of his writings, practically speaking. I think his letter to the Philemon didn't uh, include anything. But otherwise, it was like all anti-Judaizer all the time. It's fascinating. Go read it. So that's what the Antichrist is going to be like, and he's going to want the third temple being built, just like Rav Shlomo does today. The Yanuka is pushing for the third temple there in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount. It's, just, it's fascinating, isn't it? And he will be inside that temple. Now, here's the kicker, though. Previously, previously in the kingdom of Israel, when Solomon built his temple, what did he put there? The Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was the seat, the mercy seat of God. And inside the mercy seat of God was what? The Ten Commandments. It was the portion of the bread that came down from heaven in the, in, uh, in, uh, in the manna in the wilderness. And it was the staff of Aaron, the law, the prophets, the, the, the miracle food from heaven. If the Old Testament was miracle food, how much more the New Testament? If the Old Testament was a foreshadowing of greater things to come, how much more that which has come? Just curious. The Holy Eucharist is, in fact, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the actual Messiah, the Son of God who took upon flesh, the only by way, why, but the only way by which we might see the Father in heaven is through him. And Our Lady, his mother, leads us to a greater fidelity, a greater relationship, a greater intimacy with him. Let that sink in for a moment. But it reminds me, because the Antichrist will claim to be God, he will set himself up in the temple, the third temple in Jerusalem, but he will want his image to be adored in every church, just like Xi Jinping. 
and Mao Zedong and the communist ideology that spreads as the errors of Russia have spread all over the world, this we can expect that in our churches the Antichrist's image will be placed, but it will be in the temple that he will rule. Taylor Marshall goes on to say the Great Tribulation will also enforce the abolition of sacred scripture, baptism, the Eucharistic sacrifice of the Mass, and the other sacraments for three and a half years. Point number six of Taylor's book is his coming will be a signaled, will be signaled by the great apostasy, a mass falling away of Christ. Number seven, he will deny that Jesus is the Father or the of the flesh. Number eight, he will claim to be the true Messiah or Christ, and that is why he must shut off all religion. All of our sacraments will be taken away, just like they did in 2020 during the great pandemic, the dress rehearsal for great things to come. If they can get them to do that, if they can get them to shutter their doors out of fear, imagine what else they can accomplish. Point number nine, Christian worship and sacraments will be banned. Point number 10, idolatry will be banned. All religions, even the, even Islam, Buddhism, all of it, paganism, all of it has to be gone because only the Messiah, the liar, pretender Messiah, the Antichrist, only him can be worshiped. Point number 11, he will appoint a false prophet who will work with these false, who will work, um, he will appoint a false prophet who will point everybody to the Antichrist. Point number 12, the world will be worshipped. The world will worship the Antichrist. Point number 13, he will still sit in the rebuilt temple. Number 14, he will destroy 10 kings. There's a few more points. We'll have to talk about it in the after show. God love you. So what did you think of today's show? Let's discuss that right now in the after show. Your take on the after take. Comment, interact live with me and the team. All you need to do is search for one of our live video feeds on Facebook, YouTube, Rumble, Twitter, LinkedIn, and elsewhere. Simply search for the Station of the Cross, Joe McLean, or a Catholic take. I'm looking forward to seeing you and interacting with you directly. It all starts right now. It's the after show. And we're back. Welcome to the After Show, everyone, and happy Friday. Happy Friday. <laughs> Very happy Friday. Is it happy Friday? I'm sure. not sure how happy it is. It's, it's, let's define terms. Happy, meaning like content in God's holy will, whatever that is. We've, we've got the terrific trio hanging out in the After Show here. It's Of course it's a happy Yeah, what more, what more do you want, Joe? Come on, you got me on <laughs> the air. You've are already you won. <laughs> are you suggesting to me that there is a trinity presence right now i specifically said trio so i don't know where Tri you're there's that. a, mm. a triad is, but certainly not a yeah. certainly not a trinity <laughs> is tr is trio yiddish for trinity we're a trilogy that's what we are tr no joe but you know what yanuka is yiddish or what yanuka means in, yeah in prodigy Hebrew? prodigy actually it's someone who is still suckling it, yeah, I know. The, the, well, when I looked it up, they said it, the, the, it has, let's, that, was, that was the thing. He was young and he was a right. prodigy. He was a baby. And look at this great thing that's happening through this baby. So they've nicknamed him the Yanuka and it's, they still use it today. They refer to him as the Yanuka. So the chosen one, the golden child, the, the promised one. That's but he, kind of but how he's not a Yanuka anymore. He, he's now an adult. So he's no longer a Yanuka. He's, he's a, he's a grown up and, uh, you know, these, they, these movements... Yeah, they still call him Yanuka, though. That's what's right, fascinating. Right. These movements do occur in Judaism in, in very small sects. Uh, there was a Ben David... I can't remember his full name yeah. at one point. The, who was The founder was of Hasidic those, Judaism. Those, the founder of Hasidic yeah. Judaism gets treated that way, too. Yeah, and, and so these things happen. These are very small groups of, of Jews. Uh, you know, I, I don't even think it's a, a big group of Hasidic. Well, that's that's kind of why I quoted the uh, the statistics on where the Orthodox Jews are today. Only only thirteen percent. They do. They the stat I saw said by twenty thirty they expect Israel to be up to six sixteen percent. I want to say no, maybe maybe it's more. Maybe it's more. Maybe it was. Um, I don't know. It's going to be more by twenty thirty, but I forget the number off the top of my head. But it's currently only sitting around thirteen percent. So. So not a lot. It's definitely not a lot. And most, I would argue, 
don't either know he exists or they ignore him altogether. Did I lose you, Mike? I think we lost your audio, Mike. By the way, let me just take a moment just to say good morning to you, more Rouge, Tim H., Sharon, good morning to you. Mike K. is obviously still commenting over there. Paul is over there. Damon is over there. Laura F., good morning to you. Praise be to God. Cindy K., good morning to you over on our Telegram. Rosemary Costa, good morning to you. Paul C. is on the team. Blake is there. Yvonne, good morning to you guys. Anna, good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out with us today over on the Telegram group. Glory be to God in all things. Um, Frank Rangel, good morning to you. Lights is 10. Colin, good morning to you. Lillian, buenos dias. Keital, um, David David Way, good morning to you. Uh, Sharon, Troy Lockett, Kilroy Jones, Liz Finch, asking for prayers, please. My anxiety is bad today because of the threats, and I'm trying so hard to, uh, not to let them scare me. I'm going to work near D.C. in an hour. Liz, we are praying for you. We are definitely praying for you. Um, be at peace. Be at peace. God's holy will in all things. God, nothing happens unless God either allows it to bring about a greater good or he intends for it to happen and it is his will, his active will that it should happen. In either case, what makes us different than the saints? The saints recognize and acknowledge this one fact, trustful surrender to divine providence. They trust God in all things. They trust God in all things. You know, it's it's why I'm such a Mary Maximalist when it comes to like not loving the chosen or or movies that depict our lady like she's she acts like you and I. You and I, um, we we have fear and we have anxiety. So did our lady. She had fear. She had she experienced fear. She experienced anxiety. The difference between her and us was she didn't give herself over to it. Whereas we dwell on it, we rack our hands over it, we, you know, white knuckle things, we grit our teeth and we feel the stress in our jawline because, uh, and our teeth get, you know, messed up because we're gritting for anxiety. We, we self-medicate ourselves to deal with our anxieties, whether with food or with drugs or sex or, you know, uh, binge watching your favorite Netflix or prime video thing or whatever. Like we, we, we deal with it in all kinds of ways. Some are healthy, some are not so healthy. Our Lady didn't do that. Our Lady trusted and accepted that whatever was happening, it was the will of God. And who is who should appro- oppose the will of God? So that's, I think, the big difference there. So let us, let, you and I are both in the same boat, Liz, and I, as well as everybody else. So let's pray. Let's pray for God's holy will to be done today. Let's pray for peace. I personally do not think we're going to see something so like earth shattering today. Uh, but I do think there will be reports that come out that are, are not great. We've already seen some um, to this point. Mike, are we, we got you back, Mike? We did. I, 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 lots of rookie moves. It's as if I'd never been on the air before today, Joe. That's right. <laughs> so. Hey, listen, all bets are off when you wake up and you're like, oh, I got a great show planned ahead of me today. And only to find out your, your guest is not coming. Well, listen, tick, you tick, know, it's tick. Same, same thing here. You know, I get up oh, in the sorry. morning, I pray. I pray, I go, I go uh, listen to the Bible uh, of, yeah. of the day, and then I listen to the Catechism of the day. At 7 o'clock, I tune in the show. Well, at Praise 6.48, God. I look at my, my messages, and I have a Joe McClain. <laughs> yeah, well, are you awake? Get up! Thank you, Zella. Hey, good so, morning to you, Alexandria Hall. Aitna, Caleb the Mechanic, good morning to you. Kevin Phillips is on the team today. Good morning to you. Immaculate Heart is here. Praise be to God. Uh, he's going to be an alien. No, he's not going to be an alien. I mean, by alien, do you mean he's not going to be originally from Israel, but from some other place? Yeah, that's possible. And in fact, uh, Rav Shlomo Ye- Ye- Yehuda, the Yanuka, is from Spain, born and raised in Spain, mm. and now lives in Jerusalem. And, uh, mm. you know, the fact that people are flocking around him and kissing his hand is not like, that's not definitive, right? Like, it is interesting. I, w- I have to argue, I think it's, I find it fascinating and interesting, but it's not definitive. I mean, non-Catholics see people kissing the hand of the Pope as worship, so like, I can see where you can make that. But you and I both know we don't worship the Pope by kissing his ring finger, even though he hates it when we do that. Maybe all the more reason for us to do it. Anyway, uh, you know, we do it out of a, out of a reverence of the office that Christ founded. <laughs> you know, like my Lord and Savior instituted the office of the papacy, instituted the office of of the uh, of of the preeminent office of the bishop in the papacy 
And whoever occupies that office, I give Christ the credit. I give God the uh, the honor and veneration, not the man, in spite of who the man is. It could be Pope Pius X, if you like, or it could be Pope Francis. doesn't matter to me because it's the office that we we venerate that is a testament to our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Charles is on the team. Alberto's here. Good morning to you. Uh, I'm just scrolling backwards. Whoa, uh, war, worry kid. Worry kid? Worry kid. Jesus is coming. Yay and amen. He is coming. Uh, Albert, whether we're ready or not. Dory is on the team today. Good morning to you. Good morning to you guys. Welcome, welcome. Isabel Molina, good morning to you. Glad you're on the team. Patty is here. Good morning to you. Rachel Jordan, good morning to you. Praise be to God. Uh, I'm scrolling backwards. Let's see here. Joshua Knoll is on the team. Good morning to you. Geo Crypto. Aliens aren't real. Aliens are just demons. <sighs> I'm on your team, Geo Crypto. Raise your hand if you think uh, aliens are actually demons. Raise your hand. Go ahead. A a amen, amen, amen. They are certainly demons. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm on that team. I am on that team. <laughs> By the way, I did finalize Daniel O'Connor, whose book out is out now. He is going to be on not this week, but the following week. Uh, he'll be on to talk about that. So I am looking forward hey, to that. Hey, Joe, let me, yeah. let me take you back a second into what you said. You talked about, you know, the, the, the foundation of the church institution of the Pope papacy. And I know you read a book that I read a few months ago here recently mm -hmm. where literally the church of the Vatican is built mm -hmm. on the rock. Yeah. Peter. Right. Matthew 16. On the rock, Peter is the yeah. is is in the foundation of the church yeah and, and i found that to be it, it's like another one of jesus's parable parables came to life in our time when we discovered that underneath in the foundations of the church there was peter's grave and i just that rocked my world when it hit me i don't know about you but i just went wow you know, yeah. on this rock i will build my church yes and literally it is the I'm, foundation <laughs> and i'm gonna go visit that i'm gonna go visit that crypt coming up this uh this this later this month i'm i have already booked my scavi tour so i'm very excited about going and seeing it unfortunately as far as i know they will not allow me to film in the crypt so it's fascinating, actually, a story. So when you go to Rome, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to take you to the locations. I'm going to film there. And next year, I'm taking a group tour. And by the way, uh, if I'm not, nobody knows this yet. So don't tell anybody. Okay. Just keep it between us. We're going to be giving away. Uh, we, okay, there's a good chance. I had to reword this because it's not been official yet. There's a good chance we're giving away two all-expense-paid seats on that pilgrimage to Italy next year. Wow. That's like, that's a lot of money. We're going to give away. We might, we might, maybe. Well, stick around. You have to see. Anyway, uh, so this, this coming October, end of October, beginning of November, I'll be in Rome filming. You guys know that. I've told you that a bunch of times. I'm going to take you to the spots. I'm going to go to at the Appian Way. And I'm going to walk the Appian Way and I'm going to end up, I'm going to go past St. Sylvester's tomb and his crypt. And I'm going to end up at uh, Quo Vadis, and I'm going to film in both locations. But when you walk the Appian Way, what do you see? This was the road Peter walked in on. This is the road that Paul might have walked in on. There's some debate whether Paul came from the Ostia Way. Did, they, did he sail all the way up to Ostia, or did he land in Naples like Peter did and walk up? Uh, it's debatable because I've read it in different books, and they make different claims, so I don't know. But either way, the Appian Way, the Via Appia, you walk that road, what do you see? Along its roadside, along, the, along this paved path, Romans, so advanced engineering. Oh, my heavens. We, I mean, anyway, that's a rabbit hole. Uh, along the sides of this paved road were the graveyards, the mausoleums, the, uh, the crypts of the Roman citizens. Some of them were famous. Some of them were rich. Some of them were poor. Well, they're all busted up now. They're all ruined. They're all ransacked. Their marble has been taken away. Their graves robbed. By who? The barbarians that came in waves. Why? Because, you know, when the Mongols pressured the, the, the tribes of Germanicus, people like Mike Koeniger there, his, his, <laughs> his, his family... Uh, my came, grandfathers his his his, his uh, <laughs> forefathers before him came rushing into the roman empire actually asking for assistance 
But the Romans were like, ah, you could, you know, you could pick our fields. It's fine. You could fight in our legions. It's, well, you can die for our cause, but you can't be citizens. I thought Mike's so ancestors that, were German, not Russian. <laughs> Tell me the difference. <laughs> One more time. <laughs> <laughs> I got it, Jake. It went over his head, but I got it. <laughs> we didn't come Russian in. We came German hey. in. <laughs> hey. <laughs> there we go. Are the, there it is. Are the two of you finish? I'm just kidding. Oh, no. Just, no. <laughs> I'm just curious. I'm just curious. Listen. Hey, Joe, though. Let, let's, anyway, let's, let me let's, just finish my point. I yeah, finish, finish, my point. finish your point. Okay. Your point. <laughs> Rabbit holes abound today. Anyway, uh, so they came in. They didn't get help. So they said, you know what? Forget it. We'll just take it over. And they started sacking the Roman Empire, the Western Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they robbed all those graves, all of them. So they, when you walk, go there today, uh, they're, they're, they're ruins, all of the graves. But there is one place where you can walk and see it as though you were there in the first century. You can do that today in Rome. There's one. There's only, there's only one where you can go, and it looks exactly like it did on the day that St. Peter was crucified upside down and St. Paul's head was lobbed off at Tre Fontane. Where is that place? That place exists beneath St. Peter's. How is this possible? That is because Constantine sealed it. This was the this was a uh, like a cemetery outside of the city walls, right next to Nero's uh, circus where Saint Peter was crucified. That is where they That is where they burned the torches, uh, the the Christian torches, and uh, they threw they threw them in hasty graves there. But that was also a necropolis where very wealthy pagan families buried their whole families there, and they had ornate crypts there. And uh, this was outdoors. This was an outdoor, open-to-the-air necropolis. Well, Constantine didn't want to destroy it, so he built on top of it, and he sealed it like a time capsule. So because he sealed it in, it was untouched through every barbarian horde that came through. It remained untouched. The Vatican, during World War II excavated the place and it was kind of controversial actually they didn't want anybody to know especially the nazis because they were on the hunt for saint peter's bones they were shocked to find the pagan crypts there they didn't expect that because it had been lost over time and today you can go to the place to see that very necropolis and you can see the graffiti wall of the pilgrims who showed up there from the time that peter was buried there to the time it had been sealed by constantine that Peter lies here, Peter's bones, and all of the graffiti is there. And so they discovered the bones of the fishermen there, and uh, they actually displayed the wrong bones for a long time till they, till they, uh, till they uh, resolved their uh, their internal controversies over who gets to say what. Uh, fast, it's a whole book on the subject. It's fascinating. Anyway, Mike, you were going to say. No, no, I, I I find it all fascinating. The other thing is those Germans who came Germaning in, they don't Russian in, they're German <laughs> is that, in. Is that the official uh, the that, is, that is the term. We don't do anything Yavon. with Russians. <laughs> we don't do anything with Russians. No, I'm I'm teasing they came that. Prussian obviously. In. Ah, very good, Jake. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So you know, you didn't puns, know this was <laughs> We need a pun counter on the screen or something. <laughs> I'll, like, I'll add that. Right? <laughs> so so welcome to a Catholic Jake. Yes. We're gonna we're gonna do this the entire rest of the show, <laughs> but no, seriously, they were Christians who ransacked Rome. The they, were became, they were Arians. They were Arians. Well, does that make them to, Christians? So Arians was the Pope. Are not Christians. So was the Pope. <laughs> the Pope was a Arian too. So so there. No, but, the Pope but, was not Arian. At no time was the Pope Arian. He's he signed under torture <laughs> and duress. It Arian does adjacent. not count. <laughs> Did he oh sign? Did he sign? Did he pinch the incense? Did he pinch the incense yeah. after being tortured? That's why he, that's why, but that's why he abdicated. Mm -hmm. He abdicated because I, he knew, I, I know he this, knew you, uh, you can't be Pope and be a heretic. He knew that. He, he, I mean, like, unlike other people, he, at the time, at the time, at the time, unlike other people, he knew you can't be a Pope and a heretic at the same time. But by, by the way, my favorite Pope is Pius V, mm -hmm. and, and because of many reasons, but Joe's to your eyes. earlier point as well, uh, <laughs> he, he's still only the Pope. He's, he's not the savior, but yeah, I, I, yes, I, yes. I, I, I get it. And, and I, I get the, the Pope Splainers who want to say, well, he just pinched the incense under duress. I'm, 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 I get you there, Pope Splainer. Well, <laughs> he, he, but, but he admitted his weakness mm -hmm. and that, and but he did the right thing. Like, okay. It, you know, he admitted his weakness, he admitted his fault, and he abdicated responsibly.
Praise be to God. What and more could you praise ask? Praise be to God. And the, you know, uh, he, he, he repented of his sins. He begged God for mercy. He confessed. Like, that's all you can ask of sinners. And uh, and I, and I would say that, that that leads by example in that regard. Whereas so often we rationalize, we relativize, we, we make excuses, we give ourselves a pass, and then, you know, we don't, we don't lead by example, so... Well, I, and, and have a, as a guy who had to repent for 40 years of being wrong, I, I get that and I do respect that. I am only teasing here. I, I, I But we do need – the church needs more St. Nicholas's and fewer who <laughs> capitulate to heresy in the name of inclusion. And, and, and you can read that inclusion. however you, yeah. you can read that however you want to read it. Uh, I meant it from the heart. So I, I think – you know, the, the the amazing turmoil within the church at that period of time should should tell us, hey, it was no different then than it is today. It, you know, it, it, there are no good old days when you really look back. And, and so yeah, we, I as, agree with as, that. as Catholics, we have to just keep studying our scripture. We need to keep being the, the, the light of the world the best we can. You know, put your bush. Don't put your light under the bushel. Put it on the top, highest point in your home and shine brightly forth. And, and, you know, there are those moments where you see one of your little guys who, who you're, you know, praying the rosary with every night come into church and he puts his finger in the holy water and he kneels towards the altar and he does the sign of the cross and he's two and a half. And you're going, well, I must be doing something right if at least he knows yeah. to do that. Right. Yeah, and and yeah, so yeah. and I see your I've seen your children and, and seen um, the fruit that you've borne at least up till now. And you and I both know some sticks, some don't. Uh, yeah. So yeah, that's it, true. It, it it is what it is. We can only give them the foundation, but you're giving them the foundation, and that's what we as Catholics have to do, and Catholic men. Uh, the one thing I want to ask you, though, Joe, and, and I listened to the Antichrist with with. I have uh, to finish it, by the way. I I I, I didn't time <laughs> well, it well. But, so but hang on. But hang I on. Didn't hang get on. All the I, points. I want to I want to talk about this real quickly before you yeah. you go to the further points. Okay. So we're talking about a creation of an ape of a church that you and I believe is probably already going on, that, that there's mm -hmm. an ape of a church being created right now, and yeah. it's going to look very much like the one true faith. It, it will look very close, because mm -hmm. Satan doesn't directly lie, he perverts truth and makes it a lie. Would you agree with that statement? Yeah, I would, yes. So how are we to know what's the ape and what's real? You know, that's getting more and more difficult, isn't it? I mean, and, yeah. and I, immediately I think of St. Ignatius of Antioch. When he wrote his seven letters to the seven churches that were in his diocese and under his authority, um, he had – the theme that you see through all seven epistles, and I would encourage you to read them. They're super fast. They're not that long. They're, it's not like modern popes that write bloody, you know, endless amounts of blah, blah. Anyway, I said a rabbit hole. Uh, you can read them quick, but there's one theme that goes through all of them, and that is avoid the anti-church. Don't go to the anti-church because there was an anti-church, which is something that, uh, that, to your point, Mike, it seems to be a tactic and strategy of the devil that has been around since day one. How do we pervert the true church? How do we attack, infest, corrupt the actual church? It's not so much, let me go start this other thing over here and get you to come over here. No, how do we pervert, attack, and corrupt within? That seems to be a strategy of the devil from day one, and it's been around the whole time. And St. Ignatius of Antioch, 110 AD, some say 107 AD, just depends on who, which scholar you listen to. Um, he wrote his seven epistles while on his way to being eaten by lions, not in the Colosseum, probably Circus Maximus, but nonetheless, uh, I'll film there too. But... Um, and, he's, and the Docetists, these were Gnostic heretics. They had been Catholic that, that decided that they had their own private revelations, their own private knowledge, secret knowledge. And essentially, they were giving themselves a pass. What if, what if we could have smells and bells? We could have liturgies. We could talk like Catholics. We could act like Catholics. We could pretend to be Catholics. From the outside looking in, you wouldn't know the diff. And what if then at the same time, we could also commit grave, perverse sexual sins, free will. We could do it all we want because it doesn't matter. Like no matter, no, no amount of sexual perversion is going to keep us from heaven. Sound familiar? Like as the mm -hmm. more things change, the more they stay the same? Because that's yeah. exactly what we're dealing with today. And that's what they were dealing with back then. The other thing they would not do uh, is they wouldn't, they wouldn't die for the cause. There was no dying on the hill. 
There was no this far and no further. There was no, uh, you have blasphemed my God and I'm going to stand up. You know, so in the in the time where uh, martyrs' blood was being shed, these people were like, I'm not going to shed my blood. And there's no way. So they would offer the incense. And they believed in Gnostic heretical teachings. And he was constantly fighting that battle with them. And you can read that in his epistles. And similar to what St. Paul was dealing with with the Judaizers, you go through Rome, Corinthians, Thessalonians, you go through all these books, all these epistles, these letters that uh, that St. Paul writes, and you see that there's a common theme here. There's a corruption, an effort from within to corrupt the body, to turn their hearts back, in the case of Judaizers, back to what? Back to the Mosaic law, back to the Pharisaical laws and the sacrificial system at the temple. And he had to fight that vigorously because it had all been fulfilled. The, the, the law that the, the Jews had been living was a, it was a remedial law. It was a punishment for the golden calf scenario. They were on timeout until when? Until the Messiah comes. And then back to the game plan, plan A. The remedial law, the Mosaic Pharisaical law, that was plan B. Plan A was the Ten Commandments, the priesthood of the firstborn, and the Messiah. That was plan A. Plan B was, well, now you have to offer offer sacrifice morning, noon, and night. You have to follow all of these regulations and laws, all of these dietary restrictions. You have to, you have to dress this way, act this way. If you're going to act like a two-year-old, I'm going to treat you like a two-year-old. I'm going to dress you. I'm going to wipe your bum. I'm going to feed you with a spoon. I'm going to take your hand and lead you around and make you do certain things. I mean, that's what the remedial law is. And that was fulfilled in Christ, and, and St. Paul had to fight that. So to your point, this is exactly the strategy that we are now facing, where we have, we have the spirit of the Antichrist trying to corrupt from within— and then ultimately, how does the Antichrist get the whole world to include Catholics? How do you, I mean, like, for, here's the deal. Let's, let's just let's spitball this. Let's, let's, let's uh, spitball this for a second. I'm the Antichrist. I know my wife is, believes that, but nonetheless, I'm the Antichrist. <laughs> <But don't. sighs> He's here all the I, I am Jewish. Or from the tribe of Dan, as St. Jerome says. And I am I'm wearing my, my black fedora. I'm reciting from memory uh, the Torah and the mystics and the Talmud and, and uh, you know, all of the, the Targums. I'm, I'm, I'm just, like, amazing the crowds, and they're flocking around me. I'm blessing people, and they're kissing my hand, and miracles are happening, and, I, and, I, and I'm doing all these things. How do I get, how do I get the, the Pope in Rome, the bishops of the church, priests, how do I get them to stop distributing Holy Communion, stop hearing confessions, stop giving, um, you know, last rites? How do I do that? How can I accomplish that? How do I get the Muslims in Gaza Strip or the West Bank or Lebanon or Iran or Saudi Arabia or any place else on planet Earth? How do I get them to stop thinking of Allah and uh, Muhammad the prophet and worship me as God because I'm God? I'm going to build that third temple. And I'm going to sit in it and I'm going to make the whole world come. I'm going to make the whole world come and worship me. How do I get them to do that? Think about that for a second. Because let's just say Mike Koeniger is the Pope. Look at him. Wouldn't he look like a good Pope? Look at that guy. He looks like he could be Pope Pius XIII. Looks like he could, hmm. he, he could be coronating the great monarch of France. Look at him. He looks, it would be awkward for a German to do that, but nonetheless. Look, look, nonetheless looks are deceiving, Joe. Looks, looks are, are deceiving. deceiving. <laughs> so I'm the Antichrist and Mike Koeniger is the Pope, all right? How, how could I force him to do this? At any time, he could say, you know what? Pack sand, Antichrist. Ain't no way I'm not shutting down my, my, my parishes. I'm not shutting down my diocese. I'm not ordering my bishops and my priests, my cardinals, to stop distributing communion, hearing confessions, or last rites. You, ain't gonna, you can't make me. Crucify me upside down if you wish. I am not going to do it. Ah, uh, but Joe, there's a virus, and we have to do it for the virus so we can save the children. Oh. Oh, and then how does the virus affect global warming? And the, you know, and how does that, yeah. you know, and, and, you know displace and how are we, uh, minority and communities? And we have to be inclusive, and, and so yeah, off we yeah, go. Yeah, we do. We and do. and, and I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not even saying it's today. I'm not even saying it's next week, but it's soon. I don't know when soon is. Right, you yeah. Know? yeah. I, I shall come as a thief in the night. 
but yes, uh, right. it, 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 it's soon, and soon could be a thousand years from now. I don't know when soon is, but it's what soon. would be your platform as Pope Pius the Thirteenth? I'm just curious. Like, what are your policies? Oh, <laughs> well, I would go back to everything that Pope Pius the Fifth did because you know, if it's really good, you copy it and, and make it. Make do we? It yours. Do we? Do we cast out all of the solar panels at Vatican City now, or do we, I have nothing. Do, I have we, nothing against solar panels. I do we balance the load with some natural gas generators? Um, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, um, first off, if you're Pope, you shouldn't have a platform, and you know that, other than the, uh, the growth of the church. What is your immigration <laughs> policy as Pope Pius XIII? I, I need to know, before I vote, I, you know, as the Antichrist, I'm obviously going to have to ratify the decision. So, you know, uh, just curious, Well, thank you, so. thank you for making me the Pope and you the Antichrist, by the way. I do appreciate that consideration. But, but, but I, I, I am sitting here, though, and, and by the way, you need to talk about the points. What were the other points that we didn't hit in the, in the regular show? One second. Uh, Joe, can I add in? So someone, someone commented earlier, Charles. Are you the prophet? I'm just curious. Like, uh, <laughs> what do you? What, what role do you play, producer Jay? This is, uh, I'm I'm just the messenger. Don't shoot. Don't he's shoot the, me. He, he's the unique. Some say a prophet. <laughs> okay. Okay. I've got I've got wings on my heels like Mercury. Hey, and this crowd, Jake, is definitely a, a Yanuka. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. I'm I'm. Did you just call me the Yakuza? What'd you say? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a different Antichrist. Okay. Would you stop, yeah. please? Okay. Anyway, so Charles says uh, he asked me to tell you um, to mention about uh, if you've heard of Father James Blunt. Uh, ex- yes, he of says course. that he's met the Antichrist and that he's a world leader. So Father Father Blunt says that he's met the Antichrist and that he's a world leader. Yeah, that's kinda, the, kinda I guess the other point this. is there are right now I would if we're being honest there's probably a handful of serious contenders that mm-hmm. people are claiming. Oh, sure. And I guess that was that's part of the point that's part of the reason why I even played the video that's part of the reason why I even brought it up is is that not that this particular Yanuka character is going to be like I said he as far as I can tell I can't find anywhere where he personally claims it. I, it looks like he's certainly enjoying the attention he's getting. Mm-hmm. I'll give him that. But he is, doesn't seem he hasn't he hasn't also said no to it either. But he hasn't really said those words. It's other people around him that are saying those words. And I think the key there is look at all these like very serious chief rabbi characters that everybody else respects. Everybody else respects these main chief rabbis as like, wow, those are the chief rabbis. Those people are coming to this young man. Mm-hmm. Those people are kissing his hand. Those people want his blessing. That is very, very telling. But nonetheless, this guy doesn't claim it. Others claim it for him. And yeah, I mean, we don't know. It's likely he's just one of many pretenders as we lead up to, th- to some things. I do want to go over the rest of these points. And if you can give me more time, Jake, to do that, <clears throat> there's a whole nother chapter. <clears throat> I may wait until Monday. There's a chapter There's in the appendix of Taylor's book is uh, Alaric. Good morning to you. Welcome to the team, by the way. There's a whole nother chapter on the timing of events. I think that's really critical. And I think I'll wait till Monday to talk about that. So let me get into these points. So I dastardly messed up the whole thing because I didn't didn't manage my clock very well going in going into the end of the show. But the point number ten was idolatry will be banned. So there will only be one world religion, and that is the religion of the Antichrist. He will be worshipped as a god. And I think most people, when they think of the Antichrist, they think of him like a Justin Trudeau, a Xi Jinping. You know, somebody who uh, – more Justin Trudeau than Xi Jinping. Why do I say that? Because part of what we believe is that he will be a small character, a tiny horn that has to overcome big horns, as the imagery suggests from the beasts in Apocalypse. He will be someone of no stature coming out of nowhere and then all of a sudden rise, combat ten kings, overcome three, kill three, and the other seven are like, all right, you're in charge. It's okay. It's cool, dude. It's all right, man. You're in charge, dude. You're the guy. So he has to come from nowhere and overcome all, and the world will be divided into kingdoms. And there's there were some very particular timing issues that I think are important to bring up. So uh, point number, let me just go back up a little bit here. I'm, I'm just going to quickly go over the other points just to recap, and then I'll, I'll move forward the ones I missed. Point number one, he will be a true human man. Point number two, he will be conceived of fornication. Point number three, he will be an Israelite. 
Point number four, the Antichrist will keep the Sabbath and follow the Jewish laws of Moses, circumcision, and kosher living. Point number five, before the Antichrist is revealed, the gospel must be preached to all nations. Point number six, his coming will be signaled by the great apostasy, a mass falling away from Christ. Point number seven, he will deny that Jesus is the father or or of the flesh, just like the Docetists, uh, for example, um, or the Marcians. Uh, or the Albigensians, or I mean, goes on and on and on. Point number eight, he will claim to be the true Messiah or Christ. Point number nine, Christian worship and sacraments will be banned. Point number 10, idolatry will be banned. So the Muslims have to get along with this. How in the world is that going to be accomplished, might you ask? Look at what we're seeing today. This on the mobile, the global uprising, the global jihad, the global Al-Aqsa flood on Friday, October the 13th. How in the world? I mean, they're, they're, they're riding in caravans shouting F to the Israelites, rape their daughters on bullhorns in the streets of London. How are you going to get them to go along with this? Think about that for a second. Meditate on that for a moment. No, point number 11. Uh, I have an idea uh, the, about how that's going to happen, by the way. It involves World War III. Point number 11, he will appoint a false prophet who will, work the, who will work three false miracles. Miracle number one, he will apparently cause fire to come down from heaven, like say in a nuclear blast. I don't know, just, just throwing them out there, just throwing out examples. Like could be a nuclear missile, you know, some prophecies say seven nuclear missiles will impact the United States, killing a third of all uh, Earth's population, kind of like a third of the stars fell, the third of the stars. Angels fell. I don't know. Could be linked. I don't know. Could be an asteroid. Could just be fire coming from the sky. Who knows? Point, it could be like a fire from an alien spacecraft. Uh, do they have fire? Or is it just lasers? Or do they use some advanced technologies? I don't know. Uh, point number uh, two, the second miracle. He will make the icon of the Antichrist speak. So there will be an icon in, uh, in places like in your church, for instance under the rule of the Antichrist that will be placed and um, will be made to venerate it, will be made to adore it, and then it will speak miraculously, this icon. And uh, the the prophet, the, ant- the Antichrist prophet, will make that happen because they'll all be controlled and possessed by the devil and demons. The third miracle, he will apparently resurrect the Antichrist from the dead. So that's an interesting question. When and where does that happen? Clearly that hasn't happened yet. There are no major headlines today about a man being killed and being resurrected from the dead, having a head wound. Is it possible that in the war with the 10 kings, in his battle with the three, he is shot in the head, dies, and is resurrected, which causes fear and trembling in everyone else, causing them all to, you must be the Messiah. Is that possible? is in the aftermath of a World War III where things ramp and kick up to a degree where the whole world goes to killing each other. And then we kick off nuclear exp- uh, weapons uh, like hypersonic EMPs from Russia that could explode over our atmosphere and here in America and shutting us all down and putting us back into the dark ages. Are we ready for this? I don't know. It could happen. It's possible. By the way, did you know that Iran has been training for such an event like that for decades? I interviewed a, uh, a retired uh, general from the Army, who the guy who helped uh, found Delta Force, by the way. Uh, he had been sounding that alarm for many, many years. He was saying, listen, Iran is currently developing rocket technology, driving their boat out to sea, shooting the thing straight up in the air, not towards a destination, but just they're just launching it straight up in the air, and they're just doing this over and over and over again. Why are they doing this? He tried to warn the world. This is training for an EMP delivery. By the way, did you know Iran and Cuba cooperate and they sometimes dock their boats in Cuba? Did you, were you, were you aware of that? Because that, that does happen. And uh, yeah, good times, good times. <clears throat> it's all possible. Point number 12, the world will worship the Antichrist as the only God from the third temple in Jerusalem. Uh, He will be, uh, point number 13, he will sit in the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem as a false messianic god. So not from Rome, although his icon probably be be there, but he will rule from Jerusalem. Very, he goes into great detail about how Jerusalem is the whore that rides the beast. 
who fornicated with Rome, who fornicated with Babylon and the kings of the earth. Jerusalem is the horror of Babylon. As much as we would love to say Rome, it is not. Rome does have its issues, and they are definitely part of the equation. Don't get, they're not off the hook, but it, the seven hills of Jerusalem are the ones we're talking about. That goes into great detail and explanation in the book that Taylor produced called The Antichrist and the Apocalypse. Goes on to say, point number 14, he will reign in partnership with the Ten Kings. Point number 15, with an enormous army, he will persecute Christians in the Battle of Armageddon, Gog and Magog to come. He says the Great Tribulation will also enforce, this is Taylor Marshall speaking, He will. the Great Tribulation will also enforce the abolition of sacred scripture. We talked about that. He says it will become a hor- it will become a time of horrible and painful martyrdom for those who love and serve Christ. St. John sees the Great Tribulation martyrs filling into heaven or filing into heaven. These are they who are come out of Great Tribulation. It is the time when Satan shall be loosed. Apocalypse 20, verse 7. Point number 16, and we're almost done. Jerusalem will be destroyed again. Point number 17, Jesus will slay the Antichrist. And point number 18, the devil, uh, the Antichrist, and the false prophet will be cast into the lake of fire. And uh, like I said, there's a whole other section on the timing of the chastisements. I want to get into that, but not today. I'll do that on uh, Monday. So, just to use our friend Rav Shlomo Yoda the Yunuka as the, our example. Again, I have n- n- no idea. Okay. I just find it fascinating. And I think when we do, when Antichrist is revealed, we can expect to see similar imagery of a man who wants to say that they practice the, Juda- the uh, Judaism to perfection and everyone respects them for that. It would look like Rev Shlomo Yoda someone who is a prodigy, someone who is above and beyond everyone else's mental capacities to memorize hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, uh, I mean, countless thousands of pages of content, to memorize it and to recite it from memory, chapter and verse. And there's video. I can show you video. Can I show my screen for a second? There is video of him doing just this. He sits there in his chair. He sits there in his chair. And he just, well, in front of these large crowds, and he closes his eyes. And he goes on for an hour or more just reciting all of this information, chapter and verse. That could be faked. Oh, sure it could. Yeah, 100%. Could you fake it that good? I couldn't fake it that good. I mean, nah. surely he's got to be a fake. But I couldn't fake it that good. There's no way, no way possible I could memorize. And let me tell you something about my memory capabilities. I, I, I argue I'm pretty good at that. Uh, in fact, when I, when I was in boot camp, I was the, um, all right, when actually I went to Navy boot camp before I went to Marine Corps boot camp. When I was in Navy boot camp in Great Lakes, I was the recruit chief petty officer, the RPOC. I was in charge of all the other recruits. And I ate last every single time. Everybody ate before me. I was always the last to eat. And I sat there and waited for everyone else to file in. The company commanders, they're not drill instructors, they're called company commanders in the Navy. He, came, he would come over to me, and he, would, and he would whisper into my ear like the false prophet into my ear. He would whisper, and he would whisper all of these like Navy slogans, these, like, like, like these chapter and verse Navy phrases, these, these scripts that Navy people, I mean, I'm sure Coast, Coasties probably do this too, you know. Oh, sure. uh, 20 degrees on the down plane, come right, hard right, or starboard, hard to starboard. I mean, like all these, like, th- things. And he's just whispering in my ear. I couldn't write him down. Just had to whisper. I was required to memorize everything this man said. Every single meal. Three meals a day, every day. And I had to, the whole time I'm eating my meal, I would, write, I would as soon as I get to the table, I would write down what, it, what, it, what he said. And then I would rehearse it as, as I was eating my food as fast as possible. And then when I was done, I had to go uh, put my, my tray away. And when I'm done, everybody was done. So they all had to go to the grinder. And I would walk over to the hatch in the room where those uh, company commanders would eat with the rest of actual Navy personnel away from us, uh, you know, uh, reviled recruits. And I would pound on the hatch and I would, I would shout it out. Everything he said, I'd have to repeat in front of all of those people. I got everyone right. I didn't miss a single one the entire time. So I've got a pretty good ability to regurgitate data. 
I memorized all three liturgies of the Freemasons when I personally went through all three of the ceremonies. I call them liturgies because they're a false religion. Of, I memorized all three in the Blue Lodge, and I recited them from memory in front of all the Masons every time. I had to sit there in a car with a Mason as he whispered into my ear the liturgy, and I had to memorize it just like I did at boot camp. And I was able to do that. So I, I feel like I have an advanced or above average, let's just say, ability to regurgitate data. But I could not do what I've seen this guy do on video. Yesterday, I watched an entire hour of him doing just this. I sat there and I had the captions on. I had to translate everything he was saying for me so I could read it. And he was just reciting the Torah, the Talmud, the mystics. And he would cite chapter and verse. Wherever he was re reciting, he would chapter and verse. And he just sat there with his eyes closed. And he just sat there for a whole hour. Could I do that? Could you do that? No, let's be honest. We could try it, but we couldn't pull it off. Uh, but, but Joe, people like that exist. We call them photographic memories. They're not, yeah. not what you think they are in Agreed. television. But, but, but they do exist. And, and, you know, you have those minds that can do that. And, uh, you know, this is, this is not the first potential Antichrist. It probably won't be the last. And uh, Exactly. I, 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 you know, as as we talk about this, and I know we got to wrap up here pretty quickly. Uh, I, I think though we're going to end up like our Japanese Catholic brothers and sisters did for the 500 years, where they didn't have priests, they didn't have a church. They're, they're going to be yeah. we're, the home church will be the cornerstone of Christian life. Uh, if if and when this when this happens, it will be the home, cornerstone of home life. So. I think, and I, you know, you've been a big downer all, all Friday. I'm just telling you, you're, you're a huge downer here, Joe. <laughs> and so I'm just going to say this. You know, what can I as a Catholic man do? I can build my home church. I can, I can build what I have here. I can recite the rosary every day with my family. I can, you know, I recite the rosary every day with our little guy that we're taking care of and, and, uh, and do that. He keeps me honest. I have to do it for him. So, so I have to say the rosary every day, right? And we can yeah. pray and we can repent and we can, we can, you know, I said there was a, a conversation going on in our, our, the back channel here and, and I was chuckling because they said, you know, what would be your, your primary plank regarding the environment if you were running for Pope? And I said, I think the primary plank of any Pope should be go forth and baptize all nations in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. And that is the primary plank the church should always have. And, when I see our popes deviate from that, um, which, by the way, I, I've talked to you about this before. I don't think I've seen a, a great pope. I may have seen a good pope in my life. Um, you know, there's certainly I, good. I, there are good moments, and yes, uh, and in each yes. of the uh, in each of the pontificates, and and I think that's key too. Is uh, we cannot throw the baby out with the bathwater. No, we, we must can't. call a we, we must call a spade a spade. We must not let error have its day. But that doesn't mean we throw everything out. Like we have to be careful of that. And, and by the way, the 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 Catholic Take Back channel has decided that the Pope will be a trans, uh, or not the Pope, the Antichrist will probably be a trans uh, woman of color. So uh, just so you know, <laughs> just so you know, <laughs> gotta meet uh, those DEI quotas. <laughs> yeah, but did they actually walk all the way across those borders or did they fly in? I mean, are they going to lie about that part? Because they will be an immigrant, right? I mean, they will be. You, you, sure. you never know. Sure. You never know. So I, yeah. I thought that. By the way, that Paul, was, asks, was Paul asks a good question. How do you know there wasn't a teleprompter? That's a great question, Paul. I don't. His eyes were closed. That well, much I know. I, I, I mean, I, I watched the, him. I'm betting the technology exists to put a teleprompter on a contact lens, or, and I'm not being funny. Or, did, is he just good at reciting what's being whispered into his ear? I don't know. It's quite possible. I mean, like, I don't believe in this guy, so I, mean, I don't know how. I, I do know this. The For the Antichrist, one thing we do know is the Antichrist can only ape God. He can only mock God. He can only pretend he is a liar hey, messiah, yep. as the actual literal translation of Matthew 24 makes clear. It is a liar messiah so however the actual messiah does it or forgive me however the actual antichrist the liar messiah does it he will be lying about it he will be faking it he will not be actually doing it he cannot actually resurrect people from the dead so either we're faking the death or 
you know, so the person was never actually dead, you know, that kind of thing, or they're animating a body that is not actually alive, you know? So that, in other words, there's going to be a, uh, a faking, a lying, a deception, a manipulation in every single miracle. You can't actually heal people from cancer uh, as the Antichrist. They just never had the cancer to begin with, right? You're not going to actually uh, ascend into heaven as he's going to try to do, and our Lord's going to strike him down with a sword of his tongue and kill him in front of all. But the good news is the Jews will come into the church thanks to the witness of Enoch and Elijah. They will be converted, which reminds us all, we should desire, pray for the conversion of the Jews. We will have to welcome them into the church someday. Are we welcoming them in but through our prayers for their conversion, even though they might be still stiff-necked and rejecting the Messiah? We must give our lives, as Our Lady asks us to in Fatima, for prayer, fasting, and penance for sinners. And let us not financially contribute or help in any way to the building of the temple. Do not be on the Antichrist team. God love you. We'll see you Monday. Have a great weekend.